Would you take your Bible and turn with me over to the book of John this morning? John chapter 14 is where we're going to look today. Last week we um, finished up um, a series of sermons that we looked at on Sunday mornings of, of looking at sin and this problem of sin in our life and what it meant to be born in death in Adam and then to be raised to walk in newness of life and complete uh, a complete new creation in Jesus Christ. And at the end of um, the sermon series, as we looked at this problem of sin in our life, and I begin to address, um, or we begin to look at the fix, the solution to that, and that is the grace of Christ, and we're not living under the law anymore, but we have been set free in Christ. And we said, but that freedom does not give us a license to live however we desire. Because in a, as a part of being under the grace, we are under the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit reigns in our life. And so uh, what we're going to do for the next few Sundays is probably uh, three or four Sundays, we are going to tackle what does it mean to live under grace and how do we live our lives allowing the Holy Spirit to live in and through every one of us. I believe wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly, that we in the church as a whole um, have a deep need for the Holy Spirit to work in every one of our lives. If we were to lay out the needs of the church, as again, as a whole, and we were to, to categorize them um, by what is the greatest need to the least of the needs, the greatest need, I believe, is that we need the Holy Spirit to work in every one of our lives. Take a look at John chapter 14, verse number 16. And I will ask the Father, these are, Jesus, this, these are Jesus' words, so Jesus is speaking here. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. So Jesus here is preparing his disciples. He knows that he's going to weigh, and we'll take a, we'll take a look at this um, chapter in depth just a little bit. Jesus knows that he's going to be killed. Uh, then after that, he's going to be buried. He's going to be resurrected. And then he will ascend back to heaven, uh, be seated at the right hand of the Father. So Jesus knows that this is coming. And what Jesus' ministry was all about is preparing those around him, his, his disciples, as well as the others around him, for that moment. And so Jesus is saying, look, I'm not going to be here forever. I'm not going to live all of my life with you here on the earth and die a natural death. Instead, I'm going to be going away. And when I go away, I will ask the Father and he will send you another advocate that will help you and be with you. And the key word is the last word of verse 16, forever. So Jesus is saying, although I will be gone the, the other advocate, another advocate, will be here with you forever. John 16, 7 says this. Again, Jesus' words. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Because I'm sure in chapter 14 here, the disciples were like, what is it? And they began to ask Jesus some questions. What do you mean you're going to be going away? And what does that mean that another comforter is, is going to be coming to us? Another advocate is going to be coming to us. And Jesus here a couple chapters later says, it's a good thing. Don't stress out about it. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And again, Jesus is preparing the way for whenever he's no longer here on earth. He's already told us that this advocate, this comforter is going to be here. And that is the Holy Spirit. And so while Jesus was with them, he was instructing his disciples. He was teaching those that were around him. But he said, once I leave, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the comforter is going to be here with you. And he's not coming unless I go. So it is very important that I do the work that I've been called to do, Jesus would say. 
And so then that way, when I leave, the Holy Spirit is going to come to you. Now, if you fast forward and you get to the book of Acts, we see where the disciples had gathered together and they had begun praying. And the fulfillment of what Jesus was saying happened in uh, Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit came in a very, very powerful way. And in the book of Acts, in the early church, we saw the Holy Spirit do some amazing things, some miraculous things. And there is no difference in what the Holy Spirit did then and what the Holy Spirit can do now in every one of our lives. The Holy Spirit is at work, if we will allow the Holy Spirit to work, in each one of our lives just the way that he was working in the book of Acts, from Acts chapter 2 all the way forward, doing miraculous things. But I think, sadly, in the life of the church as a whole, we don't see that played out. We don't see miracles happen the way that it did in the book of Acts. We don't see the church grow the way that it did in the book of Acts. We don't see the Holy Spirit doing amazing things in the lives of the people the way that it did in the book of Acts because we don't rely on the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it is good that I go away. It's good for you that I go away so that the Holy Spirit will come and you will be able to do the things in your, you will be able to do the things that Jesus did in each one of their lives. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, one of the scriptures that we looked at the past four weeks is we talked about the struggle is real in all of our lives, the struggle of sin. We looked at this scripture. And it says in Romans 8, 9, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the spirit. Now, Paul is writing to the believers in Rome. These people are believers. And Paul is having to remind them, you're not in the flesh anymore. You are in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. And so Paul is telling the believers, the Spirit is in you. It's there. And so what you have to do is allow the Spirit to work in and through your life. Paul said to the believers in Rome, look at the things that have been going on in the church. Look at the miracles that have been worked. Look at the lives that have been changed. Look at people that are no longer the way that they once were, operating in the flesh. Instead, they are operating in the Spirit. And Paul is begging the believers. He's exhorting the believers to say, let the Holy Spirit work in your life the way that He's working in the life of the rest of the church. You're no longer a part of the flesh because you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. If you go on to another scripture that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, he said, Don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Temples, actual temples of the Holy Spirit who is inside of you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Paul is reminding the Corinthian believers that you don't belong to yourself anymore. Because on the cross of Calvary, Jesus paid the price to purchase you. And once you believed in Christ, and once you accepted Christ as your Savior, you're not your own anymore. The decisions that you make are not your decisions to be making. The thoughts that you think are not your thoughts to be thinking. What you do with your hands and what you do with your feet and what you do with your body no longer belongs to you because you were bought with a price. Your body has become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And what we need as a church is to remind ourselves that we don't belong to ourselves anymore. Because the Spirit of God lives inside of us. And if the Spirit of God lives inside of us, we have to allow God's Spirit to live through every one of us. And so the next few weeks, we're going to look at, well, what does that mean? Because I believe, sadly, sadly, in the life of the church, there, has a, there is a perverted teaching on the Holy Spirit. And what we have to do is take what the Scripture teaches us 
and about the Holy Spirit and apply it correctly in every one of our lives. And it begins with the foundation of these scriptures that I've shared with you already this morning. That we don't belong to ourselves. We were bought with a price. Our bodies have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we have to allow God's Spirit to live in and through every single one of us. And so what that looks like, as we looked at these, these past several weeks, if we looked at if we were born in Adam, we were in death. We were not truly living. We were just here. Life was destined for death. Death, because that's what sin brought, and that's where Adam was at. But we moved from death to having a new life being purchased with a price, and we placed our life in Jesus Christ. And so when our life became a part of Jesus Christ, we have been given new life. We once were dead, but now we have new life. And whenever we are living a new life then we are allowing the Holy Spirit to live in and through every single one of us. But I think if you examined the church today, you would still see a lot of death. And that is because we forget the true teaching of the Holy Spirit. And so I believe what we need as a church is a fresh experience of the Holy Spirit to breathe life back on us, remind us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that He is living in us, allow Him to live through us, so that fresh experience comes into our lives to produce the fruits of the Spirit that we looked at last week. We can't produce those fruits. It's not possible for us to do that. Those fruits are only produced whenever the Holy Spirit lives in our life. So take a look at John chapter 14 in the very, very beginning. Let's look at Jesus' words here. Some of these might be familiar to you. Jesus said in verse 1, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I like to think of it as mansions. I want a mansion when I get to heaven. Um, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where, I, where I'm going. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Now Jesus, there's no dispute here. Jesus said, I'm going away. <laughs> We already read a couple scriptures, and we'll get to, to um, that other scripture here in just a minute that we already looked at. But Jesus is saying, I'm going away. My purpose is to go away, to die for your sins, to buy you with a price, and then I'm going away to prepare a place for you. I'm going to be gone. And take a look at verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Now they're thinking at this point, especially Thomas, uh, we're not sure. Where are you going? To Galilee? Or are you going to spend some time? Where, where exactly are you going to be going? And they're already thinking the way that we think in our life. Okay, we know you're going to be there. So give me a list of things that I need to do in order for me to get to where you're going. And so Jesus goes into and explains that a little bit there for Thomas. Take a look at verse 12 as well as, as, well as the others. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And so here Jesus is preparing the disciples for what he's going to say next. He says, because I'm going to be gone, you've got to continue the work of the church. And he's about to tell them how they're going to continue the work of the church. But notice what Jesus says. He says, you're going to do even greater things than I've done. Just think of what Jesus did while he was here on the earth. Just think of the miracles that Jesus worked here on the earth. And he says to his disciples, you are going to do, the church that comes after me is going to do even greater things. Now, do we see those things happening today? Mm -mm. Because we don't rely on the Holy Spirit. Because we don't rely on God's Spirit living in and through us. Take a look at verse 15. If you love me, you will obey what I have commanded. You see, Jesus isn't giving us a license to go out and live our life any way that we want to live. 
Jesus is saying, if you love me, if you love me, and if you have accepted me purchasing you with a price, you're going to obey the things that I've commanded. It's not a license. Grace is not a license to go out and live your life however you want. It's to obey the things that, that I've commanded, Jesus said in verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. We looked at that verse. In verse 17, it says, The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me, because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Now, how is that possible? How is that possible? It is only possible because of what Jesus said in verse 16. The Holy Spirit is inside of us. Now, the word that Jesus used there in verse 16 is another advocate. And if you look at the Greek word for another that is used there, it is like the first, not different from the original. That's what's meant there. And so then Jesus goes on to lay out the case. The Father is in me, and I am inside of you. And there Jesus gives a perfect explanation of what the Trinity is. The Father is in Jesus. Jesus is going to be inside of you because he's leaving an advocate for us. And that advocate is the Holy Spirit. And we want to live our lives however we want and not rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, I am inside of you. I am inside of you. I have given you a power. I have given you a new life. I have bought you and I am there inside of you. And so the way that we should be living our life is if Christ is right next to us, walking beside us every single second of every single day. Because He's not only there, He is inside of us. And the power, Paul said in Romans chapter 8 that we looked at last week, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that resides inside of you. So now think about the power that it took to raise somebody back from the dead to life. That's the power that is inside of you because Jesus is there in the Holy Spirit in every one of us. It's Christ inside of us in the Holy Spirit living his life through us. That's what it means to no longer be in Adam and to be in Christ. We belong to Christ because he is inside of us. Now, if the church could grasp that today, I don't think we would see a dead, powerless church. I think we would see a vibrant, living church that is changing lives. But instead, we get a secondhand religion that's not changing much of anything because we're not relying on the power of the Holy Spirit that is inside of all of us. I want you to ask yourself this question this morning. Ask Honestly, ask yourself this question this morning. When was the last time that I saw the Holy Spirit at work in or around me? Ask yourself that question. When was the last time that you saw the Holy Spirit at work in or around you? And then ask yourself this question. How can I live the Christian life, the life that Christ has asked me to live, if I don't have a good answer for that question? You see, every second of every day is when we should see the Holy Spirit living in and through us. And when we don't, we have gone back to living the way that Adam was living under the power of death and not under the life that came to us through Christ and with the Holy Spirit living in and through every single one of us. Now, maybe the problem, just maybe the problem is that we've got this head knowledge of what the scriptures are telling us, but we don't have this relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to ask you to do is to begin thinking of this, this Holy Spirit living in and through you just as you would a relationship with anybody that you know, because this is an actual presence of God 
Or sometimes I, I think the word spirit throws us completely off and it gets us into some magical, mystical, bad theology of teaching. And that's not what it's about. It is about a relationship with God, the Father, and Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit living inside of every one of us. So this relationship is exactly the way that we should be living our life. We should be talking. I, I talk to the Holy Spirit. I say, God... I need your Holy Spirit to help me right now. When I pray, I speak to the Holy Spirit because I'm speaking to God. Jesus laid that out in John chapter 14. It is just God in and through us. But I think what happens is instead of focusing on that relationship, we live our lives as followers of Christ as if there is something missing. And so we're just content with going around living this way. In John chapter 6, verse 63, it says, The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. But we've missed the obvious. Jesus said, I'm giving you the words, but we've missed the obvious. So what happens is our everyday life doesn't match the scripture and the experience that Jesus was telling his disciples and followers. We missed it. We've missed it. But today is a day to correct it. A day to fix it. Because when we allow the Holy Spirit to live our lives for us, it makes a radical change that can only come through the Holy Spirit's presence in our life. I want you, if you would, to turn to Galatians chapter 5. We looked a little bit at Galatians chapter 5 last week. I want to look at a couple other scriptures in Galatians chapter 5. And while you are looking at Galatians chapter 5, I have just a short video that I want to show you this morning. That is the, a, a visual demonstration of the change that happens in our life. Of how we once were one thing and we became something else whenever the Holy Spirit came and lived inside of us. Because just as that caterpillar was one thing, the butterfly was co something completely different. Same species, same thing. It just made a transformation. And that's the change that I'm talking about happens in our life whenever the Holy Spirit comes in. Just like the caterpillar is no longer roaming around in the dirt. It's no longer walking short distances just trying to find something to eat. It is no longer a worm crawling around on whatever surface that it can find. Instead, it has a new body. It has been given wings. It has been completely changed. And that's the change that happens inside of us. We're no longer stuck, destined crawling around in the dirt with one way of life. Instead, we've been called to fly high above all of the junk that life gives us. Now, that doesn't mean we don't go through junk, and that doesn't mean that junk doesn't come at us and sometimes stick to us. It just means that the Holy Spirit has made us something completely new. It started when we accepted Christ as our Savior. And we were changed. And that change continues in us when the Holy Spirit is in and through us. We've been set free. 
free. We've been changed. We're no longer the way we once were. We are something brand new. And that is God's Spirit inside of us. In Galatians, sorry I didn't turn there myself. In Galatians chapter 5, um, take a look at verse number 13 with me if you would. In verse 13, Paul says, You, my brothers, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. Now, Paul says again, this freedom that you were given is not a freedom and grace to go out and live your life however you want to. It is a freedom that comes with Christ changing your address from death into life. And we can't go back to that. Instead, we are in Christ, and the way that we remain is the Holy Spirit in and through us. You, Paul said, you were called to be free, and so we've been set free. Just the way that we saw the change in that caterpillar, going from a caterpillar to a butterfly. It was set free. It was changed. It was made something brand new, and that's the life that we are living. Take a look at verse 14. Paul goes on to say, the the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the spirit, what is contrary to the sinful nature, they are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Paul says you've been changed. You've been set free. Don't go back to living under the chains of sin and death, but become something new. But yet we just gather in the church on Sunday mornings and we fret And we wonder why the world is the way that it is. It's because we are not living by the Spirit. And until we as a church grasp this foundational teaching of the New Testament, the world and our country and this community will never be changed. It's one thing to pray for revival than it is to pray for revival and to live by the Spirit. Because the way revival comes in our lives, in our church, in our community, in our country, is not just to gather and pray for revival, but to pray for revival and to allow the Holy Spirit to live in and through us. We have been set free. There's a radical change that has happened to us. But instead... The Holy Spirit is being neglected in our churches today. And we're caught up trying to live our life the way that we want to live our life, making our decisions, doing the things that we want to do, instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to live in and through us. Now, if you got nothing else this morning, I want you to get this. Life change only comes through the power of of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way it comes. Life change only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that starts in the church. Can't start in the world. It starts in the church. So you can take the word life out of there. And you can put in family change. You want your family to be changed? You want God to work in your family? Family change only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. You want your neighbors to be changed? You want your spouse to be changed? You want the people that you work with to be changed? That only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. You want your city to be changed? You want your country to be changed? You want this world to be changed? That only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the way that it starts is in the church. Who was the Holy Spirit given to on the day of Pentecost? The believers. Who did the Holy Spirit work through all throughout the book of Acts? 
the believers. God works through His Holy Spirit today. And you are the ones that get the privilege of having the Holy Spirit inside of you, having God Himself inside of you to go out and live this every single day. Now, Paul said, this is the command that you have to observe. This is the command. Love one another. And so we say, love God, love people, and do something about it. That is Holy Spirit living. That is God changing the world, changing the people around you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to ask you to do this morning is to, commit, is to make a commitment. I'm not asking you to make a, make a commitment for the rest of your life. I, I don't want to ask you to do that. Because I think that when we do that, we set ourselves up for, for, up for failure. What I'm asking you to do is to make a commitment to God for one day. One day. One 24-hour period. To let the Holy Spirit take control of everything in your life. One day. And see what God does in that one day. And then wake up the second day and make that same commitment. And see what God does on the second day. You see, God didn't make the world in one day. He did it in 24-hour periods of time, working six days in a row. And you're not going to change your life by trying to live all of it at one time. What you have to do is let the Holy Spirit live in and through you one day at a time. So that's the commitment that I want to ask you to make this morning. Would you commit to allowing the Holy Spirit to reign in and through you for one day. One day, that's it. One day. Would you be humble enough to put your agenda on the back burner and to cast your wants and your needs aside to let the Holy Spirit come in and reign in your life? Would you be open to allowing the Holy Spirit to take complete control for one day? And then when you get one day, God will work on the second day whenever it gets there. And then you get the third day. And then before you know it, it's something that comes natural to you. But what you have to do is live one day at a time. Father, we come to you this morning. And we just say, Lord, we're yielding ourselves to you. You know, there are times, God, that we just totally mess it up. We just totally go back to living under death and go back to living in the flesh. But God, we say right now as a church and as individuals, we're not living that way anymore. We're ready for change to happen in our lives, in this church's life, in our community's life, in our state's life, in our country's life, in the life of this world. We're ready for you to change this world radically. And God, we know it starts right here with us today. So Lord, we're making that commitment this morning that we're going to let the Holy Spirit live in and through us. We're going to not walk in our desires and our wants. We're going to let you live life through us. Father, in this time together this morning, it's my prayer that you speak to us. We respond to the things that you're saying to us. Lord, we put ourselves in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.